just start by telling you a little bit about the C40 for those who don't know us. Um, C40 is a group of the world's largest cities, the ones on the, the screen here now, where despite the name, we were once the 40 largest cities in the world, we now have 70 um, members, and it's an organisation of mayors focused specifically around climate change, but clearly when the mayors of the big cities get together, they tend to talk about a, a wider range um, of topics. And it's got a, a pretty simple premise, which is the best person for one mayor to learn from about trying to tackle problems in their city is a mayor from another city who has tried and succeeded with the same problem. And despite the fact that when you, you look across the sort of geographies here, there's some quite wide differences in the, in the, the topography of cities, the, the income of cities, the, the, where, they, where they are in the world. What we find is when you get the, the big cities together, they've got pretty common problems. They're all dealing with the issues of, of, of how to um, increase mass transit, improve people's quality of life in an urban setting, redu reduce pollution, etc. So we're seeing in, in the C40 an acceleration in action around climate change pretty much through the simple sharing of best practice uh, amongst these leaders. Uh, we were uh, created back in 2005 by uh, the then mayor of this city, Ken Livingston, uh, and have since been chaired um, by uh, Mike Bloomberg when he was mayor of New York and now by the mayor of Rio, Eduardo Pires. And I'm going to draw on um, some experience of what the leaders of these big cities are discussing in the context of what will be successful, sustainable cities of the future um, to, to draw some generic conclusions. But as a starting point, um, just thinking about why we should talk about cities in the context of an issue like climate change um, or sustainability, an issue and particularly climate change that for, for a long time we've thought has to be solved at the, the big intergovernmental level by national leaders coming together um, to find solutions. Um, the simple answer to that is whether or not we are able to succeed in tackling climate change to constrain global average temperature rises below two degrees, which now looks like a very difficult target, is largely going to be determined what, by what happens not just in cities, but in a, a relatively small number of cities, the biggest cities in the world. And the, the, um, the New Climate Economy report, very good report published um, a few months ago, found the statistic here on the screen that just 468 cities around the world, which includes all of, all of the 70 members of the C40, will contribute 60% of GDP growth out to 2030 and about 50% of carbon emission growth if they continue on a business as usual um, trajectory. So a pretty small number of cities are going to determine to a large extent whether or not the, um, the world is able to tackle climate change. The good news is that a model of urban green growth is possible because we can see it happen in, albeit, a relatively um, small number of cities. The graph on the screen here is for Portland, um, Oregon, um, looking at the changes in its economic and pollution profile over the last 20 years. And you can see that the lines are going in the right direction. So the two blue lines, uh, the, the top one, GVA per, per capita, growing very strongly over that period. Nice steady increase um, in employment uh, over the same period. But the bottom line, the sort of purplish colour, greenhouse gas emissions per capita have gone down pretty steeply. So Portland appears, at least on the surface level, it appears to have achieved that, that uh, decoupling of, uh, of economic growth from environmental pollution. There, of course, there are a few things be behind those numbers. These are all taking figures for emissions produced within the city. They're not looking at the consumption-based model, which would show a slightly different um, picture because now a lot of the, the products that were produced in the west coast of the USA are being produced in China and elsewhere. But nevertheless, Portland, Stockholm, Copenhagen, one or two cities around the world have got a profile um, like this. And what the new climate economy report very strongly found is that rather than there, now, there being a sort of a choice between strong economic growth and policies to tackle climate change, actually the two were largely intertwined. The things that will deliver a lower carbon future in urban areas are largely the ones that will also achieve, have the, present the best chance of sustainable economic growth uh, in the future. And we certainly see that pattern replicated within uh, the C40. We do a, a survey of 
all of our members every two years, it's a, a, a pretty data intensive one, they report on over 1,500 actions that they're taking um, across all urban infrastructure and we're looking for trends in, in, in what those cities, those mayors are doing related to climate change. And what we found at the high level is that the amount of reported action with a consequence of reducing carbon emissions has doubled in a two year period. That growth is pretty constant across most of the, the, the sectors of the economy um, that we, we looked at with the, the largest uh, a number of action growth occurring in the, in the transport sector. Uh, and there's a, a missing bit there, but it's, it's the, uh, the building sector. So taking, taking that sort of basic premise that whether or not we're able to move to a, uh, a, a world that is sustainable in the long term, taking climate change as the, as the ability to tackle climate change as the proxy of that will largely be determined what, by what happens in cities and in particular a small number of very big cities. What are the elements of a successful uh, low carbon city in the future? And I'm, I'm going to stick here with the, the theme of the new climate economy report because I thought it was very clear and succinct. And they, they established the, the three C's, that cities need to be compact, uh, they need to be highly coordinated but based on mass transit rather than private uh, mechanical vehicles, and they need to be highly coordinated, which is a more nebulous context uh, concept that I'll talk a little bit about. So starting with that first theme of uh, compact cities being the, the sustainable model for the future, or to put, turn it on its head and take the negative, sprawl is the enemy. If you look at um, patterns of growth in the 20th century and then projecting them, them, them forwards in the 21st century, 60% of growth in energy consumption has been due to urban sprawl, i.e., additional energy consumption necessary because of the type of growth, the, the, bit, the sprawling cities that require all that additional transport, extra uh, construction, uh, and indeed taking the statistic here from the New Climate Economy Report, extra concrete and steel alone could add 470 gigatons of carbon emissions by 2050 if we continued on the sprawl-based model um, of urban um, development. We also know the very human consequences, 7 million premature deaths due to air pollution in 2012 alone. I've just been in China for two weeks and could feel that at a very personal level. The, the air in Beijing is, you know, you can taste it in your mouth how polluted it is and you, everybody out on the streets um, coughing all the time. This is a, a nation that's really struggling with the, the, the consequences of their very rapid economic growth over, over the last few years. So compact, the alternative to that sprawling model, which is, let's, let's be honest, it's a Western model, it's, it's particularly a North American model um, of the late 20th century. The alternative to that, compact, dense cities, we can see in those that have taken that model are much more um, efficient. Um, and to, to bring it down to an individual um, city level, this is taking some work by the London School of Economics. Houston, which perhaps epitomises the North American sprawl, it's almost a city that's designed for cars. You, you go there and the car is, is completely um, king. They spend 14% of their annual GDP on servicing their transport system. Copenhagen, perhaps the other extreme, uh, a very deliberately designed city over the last 30 or 40 years to be compact and dense and highly based not merely on, on mass transit, on public transport, but also on cycling as the major mode um, for getting to work. The mayor there has a target that 50% of trips to work will be by bicycle by 2020, and they're already over 40%. There, they only spend 4% of their, their annual GDP on servicing transport. So a huge economic premium through having um, this, this compact, dense model. Of course, it's required a very consistent um, planning approach in the case of Copenhagen that has straddled changes of, of political leadership across the city over a number of decades. And illustrated by this so-called Copenhagen five-finger um, planning rule, the highest density living areas within the city very closely follow the major metro lines in this case. I think one of them is a bus line, but mostly the metro lines because they've had a pretty rigid planning rule that you can only build major new uh, commercial or residential space if it's within 200 metres of a major public transport node. Uh, and that policy is now being taken to a, a further degree with the stipula stipulations around or a, a, a preference for cycling in all new, um, new planning, which is really very severely restricting the opportunity for car-based mobility. And mobility is really at the centre of this, the, the successful model of the compact dense city, mobility um, based on um, mass transit. Um, 
And I've, I've used here the, the sort of quote that I think sort of epitomises the successful approach that comes from the extraordinary uh, one-term mayor of Bogota, Enrico Penalosa, a, a, a guy who was only in office for three years but achieved an extraordinary amount in that very short time. And his, his sort of motto was that a successful city is not where the poor drive cars but where the rich choose to take the bus. And he, in Bogota, uh, implemented this, this very successful model of um, bus rapid transit, um, recognising that the city didn't have the budgets to invest in the underground metro systems that many of the richer western cities um, have used, and instead found a way to prioritise buses um, to such an extent across the city that you can rely on the bus for fast express services, even from the suburbs into the central business um, district. And we're finding in, in the C40 now that model of BRT is really transforming ideas of, of urban mobility across the world, not just in, in the global south. And indeed, whilst this is a, an idea that very much started in, in Latin America, in, in Curitiba, in, in Brazil, in Bogota, in, in Colombia, now in the C40, the uh, majority of bus rapid transit schemes are in the West. And indeed, that's true in, in the world as a whole. 150 city, cities around the world have copied these this kind of, uh, of transport uh, planning, and it's, and it, it's in the West that the majority uh, now set. That's quite a different philosophy, though, um, Penelosa's, that, the, that a successful city is, is, is not where the poor drive cars, but where the rich choose to take the bus, than that which has been the dominant model in most of the West. And if you think back to, to Margaret Thatcher in the 80s, who, who famously said, if you, you see um, a man on a bus aged over 30, and she, she was very gender-specific, if you see a man on a bus aged over 30, you know you're looking at a failure. Such a, a you know, and that, that, that drove our transport policy uh, in, in, in this country. When I, I was worked for, for eight years as an advisor to Ken Livingston when, when he was mayor, and the transport system that we inherited in 2000 was one which, in common with the rest of the country, bus passenger numbers were in decline, despite the fact that population was growing quite strongly and there was terrible congestion in the centre of the city. And a lot of what we found when we surveyed Londoners in those early years which, which was that people felt socially awkward about using the bus because they felt it was a sign that they were unsuccessful, that, it was, that the bus was for the poor. And that has, that's changed very much in this city and indeed in many uh, Western cities now, but it's needed um, significant push and we should note that a lot of the impetus of that has come uh, from the Global South. And indeed we're seeing now in many C40 member cities the use of transport policy to achieve social as well as economic and environmental um, outcomes. The mayor of Johannesburg has a wonderful scheme called um, Corridors of Freedom, which is really a glorified bus rapid transit scheme, but from the, the ghettos of Soweto, taking a population that despite 20 years since the abolition of apartheid is still extremely discriminated against in terms of geography in the city that the majority of the black population still lives in the outskirts, the jobs are still in the centre. The bus rapid transit is now connecting people to those jobs, but they're using the release of land, increase of land value along the routes to invest in significant increases in social housing, which will help change that pattern of living um, within the city uh, in the next decade or so. Of course, to, to change the, the pattern of transport within um, a city requires quite significant brave leadership. We've all become very um, attached to our cars in the West and you can see that pattern being repeated in the economies that where economic growth is strongest at the moment. Uh, at the end of my, my trip in, in China, I was in Shenzhen where the mayor was explaining to me that 10 years ago there were only 500,000 cars on the road in Shenzhen. Uh, last week there were 3.5 million but their projection for 2020 is 9 million. 9 million cars on the road um, in one city. And that they're, they're, the city is going to grind to a halt if they do get to that level, but also they're going to have some severe problems around life expectancy because of the, the air pollution. He, he's, he's implementing two solutions. One there is an ex extraordinary um, development of electric um, vehicles. If you think here, we have... Uh, two electric buses on the road in Shenzhen. They have 800 in operation uh, already. And the company BYD that's based in, in, in Shenzhen has 700 in Nanjing, 500 in Beijing. There's a, the, the numbers of, in their pilot schemes are, are so different to that in Europe. 
but also they know they need to change the model. Uh, they need to change people's aspirations away from seeing the car as the symbol of success uh, to seeing good mobility um, as a symbol of success as provided through very high quality public transport systems. But the city that I, I've chosen to highlight uh, in the slide here is the one where I think is the most extraordinary transformation is, is trying to be achieved. And this is in Rio in, um, in Brazil. Uh, and as I said, the chair of the C40 uh, since last December is the, the mayor of Rio, Eduardo Paez. Uh, I became the, the chief executive at the same time. And I, I went down to, to Rio to, to meet him for the first time in December. He was about half an hour late for our meeting. He's, he's allowed to. He's the boss. He's the mayor. But it was a, I, it was, I was a bit shocked when he came in because he was covered in dust. And his suit was just kind of grey with, with this dust. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm late. I've just been dynamiting a highway. <laughs> and he had been blowing up the six-lane highway um, that goes uh, just, just um, east of the Copacabana um, beach near where the, the, the Olympic site is be, as a real symbol of his intention to achieve what would be an extraordinary uh, mobility revolution, moving from 18, 1.8% of trips by public transport uh, in 2009 to 63%, I don't know why they're so precise, but over 60% by the end of his mayoral term in 2016. So in, in eight years, he's, he's attempting a three-fold increase, in, increase in public transport, largely on the basis of bus rapid transit, but with a very significant uh, uh, investment in cycling infrastructure in the city, but also as well some of these symbolic changes in taking out road space in, in a major downtown area. So the New Climate Economy Report focuses very much on, on this compact model and the connected model um, based on public transport. But of course... There are some other issues in addition to planning and transport policy, which obviously are, are critical to delivering um, sustainable cities. Um, and one that's very important within, within the C40 is reducing energy consumption uh, within buildings. 45% uh, of reported emissions in C40 cities comes from buildings. You can see that's highest in, in Europe, but also growing very fast uh, in East Asia. And this is an area where we're seeing some real innovation at, at the metropolitan metropolitan level now that one might have expected to come at the national level. Every, every, every business conference I go to, this, this may be different, but um, the, the real demand from business in terms of tackling climate change is for carbon pricing to set that level playing field, which will stimulate investment in, in the green industries. Struggling to see national governments doing that in many cases, but it's interesting now that Tokyo has itself gone ahead because it couldn't persuade the national government to do so. Its own cap and trade system uh, for but to drive building energy efficiencies. It covers 1,400 buildings at the moment. Interestingly, there's not there's been a lot of capping and not very much trading in Tokyo because most of the uh, Tokyo best firms have seen it as a, a sign of dishonour if they don't achieve the targets, and so they've all all up their game and there's hardly been any trading. Actually, in, in the Chinese cities that are now copying this model, it, it says six on the, on the slide I learned in Shenzhen, it's, it's now seven. Uh, there is quite a bit of training happening, and, and the Chinese government, I was talking to their uh, lead climate change policymaker last week, they intend to roll this out across all of the major Chinese cities now. And indeed, in Shenzhen, the mayor is thinking of moving from having a cap-and-trade system that is just for buildings to starting to include cars in that, in that cap-and-trade system so that they will limit the absolute uh, number of cars in the city through the price mechanism, which I think is a very uh, sensible way forward. And, it, and in other ways, we've seen uh, mayors using their control over elements of property taxes um, to influence the market. Melbourne's got its 1,200 uh, building programme, which is an attempt to improve energy efficiency in private sector commercial um, buildings. But they've, they've shifted the market by allowing the um, collection of uh, repayment for, uh, against loans for that energy efficiency programme to be repaid through the local property tax, thus massively de-risking uh, the investment from the bank's point of view and starting to bring down the cost um, for building owners. So I'll finish with just thinking about the third of those three Cs, which is that the successful cities in, in the future will be the ones that are most coordinated. And just to, to put in a, in a plug here, because I've mostly concentrated on cities elsewhere in the world, it's easy in our own city to, to be down on everything and think that things don't work. But we should note that actually the city, the, one of the things that cities around the world in the C40 look to London for is the success of our public transport model in London over the last 10 or 12 years. And that's primarily seen because of enlightened legislation uh, by the, the Tony Blair government at the time to create Transport for London and invest 
all of the, the control over all of the main levers of transport power uh, in one body controlled by the democratically elected mayor. And London remains one of the, the few big cities in the world that has achieved that sort of modal shift where there's been a, an absolute reduction in the number of car trips because there's been such investment in public transport that Ken Livingstone achieved and those numbers have continued uh, under Boris Johnson. But the other two aspects of, of coordination that I, I, I want to focus on is first the growing use of the so-called smart city model, the use of information communication technology to improve the efficient running um, of the city. Barcelona is probably the most uh, advanced with their, their urban platform, which is now bringing together a whole series of data platforms across the police, the other emergency services, the transport system, the waste system, crowdsourcing uh, from smartphones in the city, so that there's a very granular level of, of data that the city can then use to better calibrate the services that it provides, but also increase levels of citizen engagement. And it's, it's interesting that in, in the United States, the Smart City program is taken up very much as a, as a as a way of delivering the sort of liberal small government dream. Two minutes, sure. Um, small government dream so that services that previously required large numbers of public sector employees to go out and survey streets for potholes, for, 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 light, for street lights that need replacing, is now being delivered through information uh, from, the, from the public. And you'll see in, in Barcelona's case, their smart city programme is intended to reduce energy consumption by 2020. <laughs> But the, the final point, I, I think, on this coordination, it's one that's not really being taken up very much at the moment, is that cities are going to need to become much better at thinking about not just the services that are provided through uh, human engineering, through concrete and steel within the city, that, but the connection between the urban area and the peri-urban, between uh, the ecosystem services that the city um, relies on. And Janine ben uh, the famous bioengineer, has got this wonderful idea at the moment that cities should be able to provide the same level of ecosystem services as the wild spaces that are adjacent to them. We don't see many that achieve anything on that scale at the moment. T Stockholm's got a wonderful uh, programme. But I love the fact that in, in one of the responses uh, to the devastation of Hurricane Sandy in New York is that in the mayor and the governor have combined with a scheme that's intended to take some of the intensity of future storms that hit their coastline um, away by replanting oyster beds um, off the coast um, of New York, providing a hard seafloor which will take some of the intensity of that storm away. But because oysters sort of purify the water, they, um, they filter the water so much, it will start to clean, clean up the Hudson and the, and the coast somewhat. And it's a nice sort of circle back to the, uh, the origins of European settlement in New York when the first British settlers <coughs> excuse me, were entirely dependent on oysters uh, for their food supply for the first year um, of, of the colony there. And indeed, it was still a working class staple in the 19th century until <coughs> overfishing wiped it out. But the, the real thing on coordination for me is not so much the coordination within the city, it's the coordination between cities. And I'm completely certain that the most successful leaders of the future and the most successful cities will be the ones that are most open to working with their peers um, across the world. That's very much what we're seeing with this group in the C40. We can see the trend in the graphs. So these are, these are comparisons between two years of survey. You'll see a six-fold increase in cycle share programs, something we very much focused on in, in, in C40. Um, over a doubling of LED street lighting programs, a tripling of the number of bus rapid transit schemes in just a two-year programme. And where this is perhaps uh, heading, oh, we may be stuck, well, I'll tell, ah, there it is, is what's, what's the sort of destination point for cities? Well, certainly I think the model of a sustainable city of the future is there. We can see what the component parts are, but perhaps there's also much a, bi a much bigger role for municipal leaders in the future. Ben Barber, the... Um, the US political theorist has got this uh, wonderful book out that he released last year, If Mayors Read the World. And he makes the very simple proposal that actually the construct of the, the nation state from the, is a, very much a sort of 18th century, early 19th century one from Western capitalism. And it's not proving suitable to the global problems of the present day. The nation state is, is there to defend the, the geographic boundaries and interests of its nation. It doesn't cope well with issues of climate change, pandemics um, across the world where cooperation is, is more needed. City leaders are finding it much easier to do that because whilst they compete in, in many ways, they compete with a race, race to the top. They compete through investing in their cities to improve cities, to improve their infrastructure, to invest, attract investment and people. So maybe there is something in the idea that mayors rule the world in the future. Thank you.